Hello and welcome back to What the Health. I'm Julie Rovner, Chief Washington Correspondent for KFF Health News. Usually I'm joined by some of the best and smartest health reporters in Washington, but today we have a special episode for you. We're taping this week on Monday, August 12th at 2 p.m. As always, news happens fast and things might have changed by the time you hear this, although this time I hope not. So here we go. So if you follow health policy, you're likely familiar with the big federal laws that have shaped how health care in the U.S. is organized and delivered and paid for. Medicare and Medicaid in 1965, HIPAA in 1996, and the Affordable Care Act in 2010, just to name a few. One you may not have heard as much about is ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, which was signed in 1974 by then-President Gerald Ford. This fall marks 50 years since ERISA became law. ERISA, as its name suggests, is mostly about protecting pension benefits for workers. It was inspired, at least in part, by the collapse of a pension fund when a plant that built Studebaker cars in Ohio shut down in 1963, but at least as legend has it, at the very last minute in the House-Senate conference in 1974, someone decided to add health benefits to ERISA's scope, and that literally changed the entirety of how health benefits are regulated in the U.S. I am pleased Pleased to have an all-star panel here to join us to talk about what ERISA has meant to health policy and what it's likely to mean going forward as it begins its second half century. Larry Levitt is Executive Vice President for Policy here at KFF and one of only a few people in the organization even nerdier than I am about things like ERISA. Paul Fronston is Director of Health Benefits Research at the Employee Benefits Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank that does research and education. Paul has also taught me more about ERISA over the years than probably any other single person. Finally, Elise Schumann is Senior Vice President of the American Benefits Council, which represents large employers and other providers of health and retirement benefits through employer-sponsored plans. Elise also spent several years on Capitol Hill working on the Senate committee that oversees ERISA policy. So a lot of knowledge here in our podcast box. Thanks for all, all of you for being here. Thank you. Great to be here. So let's start at the beginning. How did health benefits wind up being covered in a law that was aimed at retiree pensions? None of us were here were there at the time. So I think anything we know is second or third hand information. And like you said, the provision was inserted at the last minute, but I think there were a lot of conversations about it leading up to it being inserted at the last minute. I think a lot of it had to do with some tensions between state regulation and federal regulation, because there were self-insured health plans in existence and self-insured benefits more generally in existence before ERISA passed, and clearly those plans wanted some federal protection regarding what they were doing, and the states wanted more regulation. And I've read a little bit about this over the years, and there was certainly some you know, lobbying for and against having a provision in there to protect self-insured plans from state regulation. So the conversations were happening. It just, you know, the language probably just didn't make it into the legislation to the last minute. And I think certainly the landscape back in 1974, as Paul talked about, was that more and more states were creating, with respect to health care, you know, their own versions of various laws. And so self-funded plans, large employers like our members, a number of them were back in existence 50 years ago, some weren't, were finding it increasingly difficult to be able to administer their self-funded plans on a uniform basis nationwide. So it wasn't in the back rooms when they were actually drafting the legislation, but certainly know that the nationwide landscape of this growing patchwork of, of state health laws was becoming increasingly problematical for uh, self-funded health plans. Yeah, I mean, this was also a, a period when health insurance was changing quite dramatically. I mean, before this time, health insurance was pretty simple. You know, it was called indemnity insurance, right? You went to the doctor, you went to the hospital, you got a claim, you filed it with your insurance company, and they paid 80% of it. You know, this was a time when PPOs were starting, managed care, HMOs 
were really just getting their start. So there was a need for much more regulation because insurance was getting more complicated. Yeah, to some degree, the HMO Act of what, 1973, right, just the year before. So HMOs were just coming on the scene and that may have played into this as well. So back in 1945, when really none of us were in the room, Congress passed something called the McCarran-Ferguson Act, which was supposed to ensure that states, rather than the federal government, retained the authority to regulate insurance. What happened in ERISA to change that? At least I think you were already sort of referring to this. And what do we mean when we talk about ERISA preemption? That's a phrase that people hear a lot and their eyes glaze over. Sure. Well, their eyes may glaze over, but it really is foundational to millions of Americans and their families that are covered by employers who decide that they want to self-fund their plans. That means that they're the ones that decide that, hey, we're going to take the risk as offering these benefits instead of the carrier. So they're not actually buying insurance because they're paying the bills. They're doing more than just paying the bill. You know, they're the ones that are ultimately assuming the risks of those claims, too. And I think the value, so maybe just to step back before we talk about what a preemption is, is what we talk about employers who decide to self-fund versus those that don't. Admittedly, many of those that self-fund are larger employers. But again, they say that, you know, we will take the risk of, you know, paying for the claims of our health insurance coverage instead of the carrier. But along with that, we get the flexibility, we get the ability to design and implement health coverage that we think meets the needs of our population, that's enabled you know, us to, speaking again from you know, self-funded employers, to implement innovative designs with the assurances that they could implement those, they could administer that on a uniform basis nationwide. So that's really what we're talking about. Preemption is the ability of self-funded employers to administer those benefits on a uniform basis nationwide. And yes, getting back to McCarran Ferguson, and if you want to talk through the sort of various layers of ERISA preemption, is you know there's something called the savings clause, which is okay. So ERISA says first threshold level, we are going to preempt state laws. But there's a savings provision that says, basically, if you're in the business of insurance, states can regulate that. But then there's this Deemer clause. Um, This is really nerdy now. So, uh, So some of your audience may be wondering here what we're talking about. I remember learning this many, many years ago. (laughs) So yeah. So if you're in law school, take note that the Deemer clause means that self-funded group health plan is deemed like not to be in the business of insurance, meaning that they don't have to comply with those state insurance laws. And here's where this gets really tangible for people, right? So uh, 150 million people have insurance coverage through an employer. It's the biggest source of health coverage. But 65% of them are in self-insured plants, like Elise was talking about. And those self-insured plans are exempt from state regulation. So if a state is regulating insurance, you know, let's say mandating benefits, mandating coverage of IVF, mandating coverage of preventive care, mastectomies, whatever, those regulations that states are putting in place do not apply to most people with employer-sponsored insurance because they are in these self-funded plans. And of course, the continuing complications that a lot of people who are in these self funded plans don't know it because they have an insurance card and it says Blue Cross or Aetna or whatever, because in their case, they have an insurance card, but the insurer is not providing insurance, right? No, it's remarkable. We, we did a survey of, of consumers about their experiences with health insurance, and we asked them, you know, what government agency do you think you would turn to with a problem with your insurance? And literally zero people said the Department of Labor, which is the government agency that actually enforces ERISA. But I guess what I was asking about are, are third-party administrators, which I think most people have never heard of until they discover that they're not subject to their state's requirement. A- absolutely. I mean, it gets really confusing, right? Because it might be that United Healthcare is administering this self-funded plan, but you as an employee in this plan have no way of really understanding, is that a self-insured plan administered by United Healthcare 
or is that an insurance plan administered by United Healthcare? And then there are these third-party administrators that you've never even heard of that are administering them for many employers. Paul, you wanted to add something. We need to distinguish between ERISA and self-insured plans, right? Because they're not one and the same. ERISA also covers fully insured plans. Right. So fully insured plans are regulated both by ERISA and at the state level. And then you've got some self-insured plans like government plans. They're not covered by ERISA. Right, but they're self-insured. So it's even more complicated than what we're making it out to be when we talk about ERISA, preemption, and self-insurance. That's just one aspect of ERISA. You know, and I think to the point about, you know, employees not sure what covers them, what doesn't cover them. Again, you know, for self-funded, you know, large employers, I mean, I think most of the employees understand from their employer, from the group health plan, what the terms of the plan are and what the benefits are. And I think in some ways, perhaps less complex than, okay, if you're an employee working in Kentucky, you have one plan. If you're an employee working in New York, you have another plan. And employees talking to each other and saying, hey, how come you have that and I don't have this? So I think that the clarity or the consistency is important, not just for employers who are administering the plan, but for employees understanding what the terms of the plans are. And also, you know, two things about sort of the benefits and, and what's covered you know, there's a difference between a state saying, okay, you have to cover this benefit and have to cover it in precisely this way versus employers who say, look, it's really important for our population to be healthy and productive to have these benefits. And so we're going to offer this benefit. We're just going to do it in the same way nationwide. And remember, ERISA, if the federal government, as it has done over the past, wants to make changes to that are applicable to group health plans, it can amend and has amended ERISA to do that. So the market reforms, for example, in the Affordable Care Act were applicable in the Public Health Service Act were sort of incorporated into ERISA. The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, for example, you know, amended ERISA. So it's like that's the lever to make changes to ERISA that will be applicable to self-funded plans as well is at the federal level. When I was first covering Congress in the 19, late 1980s and early 1990s, you didn't go there if you wanted to do something about health policy. You didn't touch ERISA. I think lawmakers were afraid of reopening it and getting into all kinds of fights. Why did that finally change? I mean, I think there was a growing recognition, particularly with the Affordable Care Act, that there were just some minimum thresholds that health coverage had to meet to be legitimate coverage. So if you look at what the ACA did, and as Ali said, those applied to all employers, all group health plans through the amendments to, to ERISA. And these were things like no pre-existing condition exclusions, you know, coverage of preventive services with no patient cost sharing, no annual and lifetime limits, uh, a cap on, on out-of-pocket costs, um, and probably the most popular provision of the ACA, coverage of dependents up to age 26. You know, there, there was no way to reach everyone with insurance without amending ERISA under the Affordable Care Act. Yeah, but there were examples pre-ACA that affected all plans or most plans, like mental health parity we didn't mention. You know, well, there's been a couple of instances of that. And certainly the Clinton Health Plan tried this and didn't succeed in the early 1990s. And HIPAA, I mean, which was, I guess, the first right. sort of like, major sort of walk into ERISA since ERISA had been passed. Right. Or um, even COBRA, you know, the ability to continue your insurance after you leave an employer was an amendment to ERISA. That's right. That one, and that was in 1986. Yeah. And even that could be confusing because it exempts smaller employers. Right? But you got the mini COBRA laws at the state level that affect some of those employers, but not every state has one. Yeah. And, and Paul, you were referring to this. We should probably talk about who's not subject to ERISA because I don't think anybody mentioned church plans. There's a rule and then there's all these exceptions. There, I think the two major categories are church plans. And I'm not sure we even have a good handle on how many people are covered by church plans because a lot of them tend to be small businesses and that may not even offer coverage, and federal, state, local government 
I'm not sure if there's another category in there that's not covered by ERISA. I believe that, that the state and local governments have their own law that's similar to ERISA, but it's not ERISA. And I think when we talk about covered by ERISA, certainly it, it's what does ERISA afford? You know, it's not just about self-funded employers being able to offer uniform benefits, you know, nationwide. There are important protections. There are important disclosure requirements for employees, for participants that are included in there that are applicable to all ERISA plans, self-funded and, you know, insured plans. And obviously on the retirement plans too, but I just think it's really important that we look to see the idea behind ERISA was that, yes, there will be this uniformity for self-funded plans, but for all ERISA plans, there are these protections and safeguards in there that are embedded in the law for the benefit of participants. And that's why you used to get like a phone book thick. This is your plan documentation. Now it's all online and it's all in four point type. But that's where that comes from, right? At the requirement that you be told everything that your plan covers. Right, correct. So Larry, you kind of referred to this earlier. Self-funded ERISA plans are regulated not by the states, but by the Department of Labor, which most people don't know. And for a long time, if you were injured or someone died as a result of being denied care, the only thing that they could recover was the cost of the care that was denied, not any damages for what happened. Um, when did that finally change? And has it finally changed? <laughs> what, what do you do now if you're if you're injured? You can't go to your state regulatory agency. No, there, there have been some changes to, to that. But, you know, enforcement of ERISA is still relatively light at the administrative level compared to what state insurance departments departments do. Um, and the Department of Labor just seems very far away to people, you know, compared to a, a state in insurance department. I think it's really this structure of ERISA that, Julie, you, you know, you said people were always resistant to amending in Congress um, that has been resistant to amendment, right? I mean, this idea that states regulate insurance directly, but that states cannot regulate group health plans under ERISA. And that's had far-reaching health policy implications. So states looking to do employer mandates or anything that directly affects those group health plans, employer health plans. Um, and that's also made... states looking to do single payer plans, right? Yeah, no, I mean, single payer, you know, there might be some ways around ERISA through through single payer and, and taxation. But, you know, ERISA has been a barrier to state health reform efforts, you know, for better or for worse. If, if maybe we can just step back 50 years. And I think it's, uh, I, I wrote down this this quote from one of the authors of ERISA, specifically on the ERISA preemption. And that was by Representative John Dent, who is a Democrat from Pennsylvania, who identified the ERISA preemption as the law's crowning achievement. And he said it was the crowning achievement because without it, the legislation would not have enjoyed the support of both labor and management, since it's so fundamental for the ability of multi-state employers to sponsor benefit plans to workers nationwide. So, you know, I think just kind of getting back into the minds of the drafters of ERISA, that bargain, if you will, that became ERISA preemption was really foundational to the law passing. And you can see why it would make sense if you work for a national company and you get transferred from one state to another, your insurance shouldn't change dramatically. Yeah. And, you know, and I think fast forward 50 years and we've got certainly post pandemic or after the pandemic, an increasingly mobile and remote workforce. And we have heard repeatedly about how ERISA preemption really promotes that worker mobility and the ability to work out of your house in another state or to be able to transfer from one location you know to another so think a little bit if we just see how the workforce itself has evolved i think that ERISA preemption provision may become even even more important and i think you know increasingly it's not just large employers that find themselves like nationwide or multi-state employers but because the workforce is more remote and mobile and wants to be, that 
more and more employers of multi-state employers too. I would say we have increasingly seen smaller employers self-funding and there are some ad advantages to that, right? They don't necessarily have to pay premium taxes to states and they are exempt from state benefit mandates uh, that apply over and above beyond the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I mean, insurers have come up with very creative ways of allowing smaller businesses to self-fund and avoiding some of the risk by layering you know, lots of reinsurance on top of that. I was going to say, along with self-funding comes ease of administration here. You, you, you know, at least you call it uniformity of benefits. But I think of you know, employers, they don't want to be offering 50 different health plans in 50 different states. And to the degree you've got the states doing something, you know, whether it's a single payer or something short of that, employers, they just want to offer everyone you know, the same benefit and make it as easy as possible to do so. And my concern is if they had to comply with 50 different state laws to do so or create 50 different benefit plans, especially today with the ACA guaranteed issue and subsidized coverage, you know, you'll get to the point where if employers didn't have the ability to provide one benefit plan across all 50 states, they're not going to do it anymore, right? They've got you know, pre-ACA might have been different, but now they've got an alternative where their employees could get coverage if they didn't offer coverage themselves. So that was all predicted. This huge movement away from employer-provided coverage after the ACA passed was predicted, and it didn't happen. I was one of those people predicting it. <laughs> yeah. Before the ACA passed, I was one of those people predicting it. And I think what happened is, one being employers, they still value the benefit. They still understand there are business reasons to offer it. And they haven't had a good excuse to get rid of it. We haven't had, other than the recession tied to COVID, we haven't had a recession. Our unemployment rate has been at historically low rates. And I think employers, they don't want to mess with something that's working for the most part because they use it to recruit and retain employees. The same, same thing they were doing back in the 1940s and 50s when they first started offering it. I think it's important to delineate the employer voice in here. And I think maybe there's a perception that employers are just writing the checks or, you know, employers and health plans are kind of conflated, you know, but employers are doing a lot more than just writing a check. And I think those, again, that, that have decided to self-fund want to be able to have control over how they're spending their health care dollars. So again, they can try to drive more affordable, higher value, higher quality health care. And so it's not just about who writes the check, but the reasons behind employers saying, hey, you know, we're going to be spending, we spend <laughs> a whole lot of money on our health benefits because we recognize that it's good business, it's good for employees, but we want to be able to have the ability to try to drive improvements in that, to drive higher value care. And so that's enabled by ERISA. So the health reforms and the health innovation, certainly there's a lot coming from the states, but there's a lot coming from employers too. So what are the b big issues going forward for ERISA? I mean, obviously there's still, you know, if you Google ERISA, you get all kinds of lawsuits and, and challenges. And I mean, it's still a very lively part of the law 50 years on. I mean, I think Julie, you mentioned these lawsuits and that that is potentially a big issue going forward. Um, something called the Consolidated Appropriations Act added some transparency in fees that self-insured employer plans paid to providers. And that's opened the door to some lawsuits challenging whether group health plans, uh, ERISA plans, are acting as appropriate fiduciaries in trying to get the, the lowest cost, particularly for prescription drugs. And these started out as kind of a fringe movement, but you know, I think pose some potential risks for group health plans. At least what are employers most concerned about? Well, I think that employers seeing the the growing number of states that are trying to chip away, if not erode in a fundamental way, ERISA preemption is really alarming. A lot of these efforts have come up 
around pharmacy benefit managers and you know efforts to to regulate pharmacy benefit managers at the state level but the way that they've done it you know the states have really taken direct aim at ERISA preemption and you know self-funded plans and I think has much broader implications for self-funded group health plans beyond you know just the the PBM context and so I think that they're looking at the growing number of states that are interested in passing laws that really erode ERISA preemption as very alarming. So I want to go around the table before we end. Sort of what what do you think has the, been the biggest impact on the health system of ERISA, both for good and for and for not so good? I mean, it's certainly one of the things that makes it so confusing to understand and explain. <laughs> Larry, you want to go first? I think the biggest impact uh, of ERISA has been putting the brakes on some state health reform efforts. States have found ways to get around it. Some raise some issues for employers, like Elise was saying, but it has really. Hello, and welcome back to What the Health. I'm Julie Rovner, Chief Washington Correspondent for KFF Health News. Usually I'm joined by some of the best and smartest health reporters in Washington, but today we have a special episode for you. We're taping this week on Monday, August 12th at 2 p.m., As always, news happens fast and things might have changed by the time you hear this, although this time I hope not. So here we go. So if you follow health policy, you're likely familiar with the big federal laws that have shaped how health care in the U.S. is organized and delivered and paid for. Medicare and Medicaid in 1965, HIPAA in 1996, and the Affordable Care Act in 2010, just to name a few. One you may not have heard as much about is ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, which was signed in 1974 by then-President Gerald Ford. This fall marks 50 years since ERISA became law. ERISA, as its name suggests, is mostly about protecting pension benefits for workers. It was inspired, at least in part, by the collapse of a pension fund when a plant that built Studebaker cars in Ohio shut down in 1963. But at least as legend has it, at the very last minute in the House Senate conference in 1974, someone decided to add health benefits to ERISA's scope, and that literally changed the entirety of how health benefits are regulated in the U.S. I am pleased to have an all-star panel here to join us to talk about what ERISA has meant to health policy and what it's likely to mean going forward as it begins its second half century. Larry Levitt is Executive Vice President for Policy here at KFF and one of only a few people in the organization even nerdier than I am about things like ERISA. Paul Fronston is Director of Health Benefits Research at the Employee Benefits Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank that does research and education. Paul has also taught me more about ERISA over the years than probably any other single person. Finally, Elise Schumann is Senior Vice President of the American Benefits Council, which represents large employers and other providers of health and retirement benefits through employer-sponsored plans. Elise also spent several years on Capitol Hill working on the Senate committee that oversees ERISA policy. So a lot of knowledge here in our podcast box. Thanks for all, all of you for being here. Thank you. Great to be here. So let's start at the beginning. How did health benefits wind up being covered in a law that was aimed at retiree pensions? None of us were here were there at the time. So I think anything we know is second or third hand information. And like you said, the provision was inserted at the last minute, but I think there were a lot of conversations about it leading up to it being inserted at the last minute. I think a lot of it had to do with some tensions between state regulation and federal regulation because there were self-insured health plans in existence and self-insured benefits more generally existence before ERISA passed, and clearly those plans wanted some federal protection regarding what they were doing, and the states wanted more regulation. And I've read a little bit about this over the years, and there was certainly some you know, lobbying for and against having a provision in there to protect self-insured plans from state regulation. So the conversations were happening. It just, you know, the language probably just didn't make it into the legislation to the last minute. 
And I think certainly the landscape back in 1974, as Paul talked about, was that more and more states were creating with respect to health care, you know, their own versions of various laws. And so self-funded plans, large employers like our members, a number of them were back in existence 50 years ago, some were, were finding it increasingly difficult to be able to administer their self-funded plans on a uniform basis nationwide. So it wasn't in the back rooms when they were actually drafting the legislation, but certainly know that the nationwide landscape of this growing patchwork of 